Um, hi, my name's Tom. Um, I'm one of the organisers or organising committee people for the Cambridge Social Society. I uh, just want to welcome everyone along this evening and thank you all for coming. Um, really looking forward to this talk. Uh, I'm just going to do a little bit of admin stuff right, and then hand it over to Mark and we'll do it quickly. So if you're new to our events, if you've come along before and you'd like to um, keep track of what we're up to, the best thing to do is just pop your email address down on the mailing list right by the door there. There's also some um, badges and uh, stickers there which are, you can just take away. A couple of copies of Red and Black which is our um, trimesterly publication we're sort of test running at the moment, so this is the second second ever issue of it um, which you can take away. Um, there's also a uh, one copy there of Ways Labour and Capital, um, which we got printed. I have a few more copies as well, and those are $10 if you would like to buy one off us, or if you want to join the Social Society, it is part of your membership pack. And if you'd like to join the Social Society, come and talk to me, or anyone who's wearing a nice t-shirt that says Social Society on it, or Martin, or anyone else who looks like a usual suspect, and you reckon they're probably a member, just talk to them, they probably are, and they'll uh, do a really good job of convincing you to join. Um, other than that, I just want to really thank the Space Academy for um, hosting us again this year. It's uh, going, I guess, into the third year at least, probably, of doing our events here. This is really good to be able to keep using the space, and um, it's, a, it's a really awesome um, resource to be able to, to, to use for, for this sort of thing. Um, uh, as far as our events go, we're here every second Wednesday doing something like this. Uh, sometimes it's a panel, sometimes it's a talk like this one. Uh, sometimes it's a film screen, though we haven't done one of those in a little while. But um, yeah, it's the best way to keep track of it. Like I say, it's just on the email list. Um, we also do social drinks on the third Wednesday of every month. At the moment, we'll be doing them at Nash Palace, uh, so on High Street. That may change as the weather changes. It's be about brave, we feel, as it gets a bit colder, but at the moment, that's where we'll be. We also do on the first Sunday of every month a sort of discussion group at the Avonwood Cottage from 11 um, till midday. Um, yeah, other than that, I guess I'll hand it over to Martin for this talk about um, William Morris. Uh, so the talk was uh, Useful Work versus Useless Toil, which is um, a, a, a sh relatively short essay by William Morris that sort of tries to go into the um, probe into the idea that a lot of what we do may actually be relatively pointless and, and, and exists for the purpose of, you know, uh, you know, perpetuating a, 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 a system of property and production and distribution and exchange that Morris and socialists would consider antiquated. And of course Morris was writing that in the 1890s, so as you can imagine now, uh, so 130 years later, we feel it's very antiquated, it's getting a little impatient perhaps, but um, that is kind of what, what Mark is going to be talking about, I think, the idea of work, um, alienation from our work, how it corresponds a little bit with Marx and Morris's ideas um, and how they sort of fit together, or don't as well. Um, one of the quotes I put in the description for the event was um, a fairly long one from Marx that I cannot remember off the top of my head, um, so bad, bad me, shame, shame. Uh, but the part that I find really interesting, and, and it's, it's um, something that's come up in another um, Another theorist that I quite like recently is his notion of, you know, uh, the highest phase of communism, or whatever you want to call it, um, uh, labour, so useful labour, productive work becomes life's prime want. So what he means there is this idea that um, in such a society where, where the organisation of production is um, so developed that actually it won't be a burden to go to work. We'll be looking for things to do because as human beings, that's part of like one of Marx's only claims around human nature is that we do quite like to go out and do something productive, you know, mess around with the world that we live in and try and change it and shape it to suit us, whether that's aesthetically, whether that's for food or necessity, whatever. Um, and basically the idea that, um, yeah, life's prime want becomes labor. And the theorist I like, Mark McNair, has brought up, you know, perhaps, what we could think about now is how much of that is already true. You know, what what level of abundance is uh, are we already at? Where um, the the notion of everyone having to work all the time is actually is actually kind of bizarre. It's it, it's producing things that nobody needs or wants, and it's it's um, slowly destroying the planet as well, or quickly depending who you ask. Um, and it's it's a real question of you know how many of our, the, the jobs that we go and do, you know, are perhaps pointless, and if we instead share the useful work how much less we could all be doing of it, and perhaps get to that point of um, everyone just, what they want for is actually labour, not um, not everything else. Uh, 
but I'll hand it over to Martin. Um, Martin is uh, excellent when it comes to talking about William Morris. He's a bit of a fanboy, I think it's fair to say. So he's always very good on this topic. Um, Martin is a relatively recent uh, immigrant to New Zealand from the UK, avoiding the, the it was the disaster of Brexit and now more, you know, Oh, it's a refugee. Then. Yes, yeah, and more bleakly the, the disaster with the COVID response there now as well. So it's a, it's a yeah, it's, it's not going well there, but it's going okay here, so that's good, and we're happy to have him. Um, he was a history teacher turned rugby league coach, um, and also a chair, a chair or a member of the board of the William Morris Society in, um, in the UK when he lived there. So it's definitely a topic he knows a lot more about than me, or perhaps anyone, which is awesome. It means we all get to learn something. So thank you for coming along. Um, again, if you want to talk about Social Society, come see me after the talk. If you want to get more information, chuck your emails down there. And I'll Thanks, Tom. Uh, oh, first of all, just to check that I don't need to use the microphone. Can everybody hear me at the back? Yeah. Okay. Sort of good, and I don't have to stand in one spot then. Thanks for that introduction, Tom. Brilliant, Tracy of Morris. I can put mine by 50% now. That's pretty good. It's quite, it's quite high. Uh, yeah, but I'm, perhaps, perhaps yeah. to raise the microphone. Pardon? Microphone, yeah. I think. Who can't hear me? I can speak louder. No, okay. <laughs> is it on? Yeah, it is on. Yeah. Okay. Um, and as Tom said, call me what you will, refugee, um, stateless, <laughs> whatever. But it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, okay, so... There's three, three different titles to this, really. William Morris Work and Leisure, Useful Work versus Useful Toil, Useless Toil, William Morris Karl Marx and Alienation. Reimagining the future of work is, I think, a pressing issue for 21st century society. Globalisation and technological change have made employment feel very precarious, to say the least. The gig economy has resulted in unemployment, low-paid jobs, a lack of employment rights, disappearance of worker satisfaction, and autonomy. We are faced with hierarchical and autocratic power structures, manipulated market mechanisms and reaped competition. But this isn't new. All of these things would have been familiar to William Morris in the second half of the 19th century. Ruth Levitas has suggested that one way to see past today's growth-based capitalist paradigm of work is through utopian thought and writing. Utopia, she argues, is a speculative exploration of a better world, rooted in a critique of the society in which it is written. It enables us to reflect critically. And William Morris, in his writings and lectures, and in his famous utopian novel News from Nowhere, was and is hugely relevant and influential in reimagining our society. Apart from the desire to produce beautiful things, he declared in 1894, in his essay, How I Became a Socialist, the leading passion in my life has been and is a hatred of modern civilization. He condemned his era's claims to triumphant social and technological process, progress, whilst at the same time pursuing an amazing array of artistic endeavors himself. Those of you who came to my more general talk on Morris last year, will know that before becoming a socialist in the early 1880s, he was a painter, he was a very well-known poet, he was a renowned designer of wallpapers, textiles, furniture, and other household goods. He campaigned for the protection of ancient buildings. He wrote prose romances, which were to be hugely influential on the development of fantasy literature, the likes of Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. And of course, he founded the hugely influential Kelmscott Press, demonstrating his mastery of typography. His reputation today is based mainly on his artistic accomplishments, and particularly his wallpaper designs. I found when I gave a talk at the WEA last year to about the same size audience as this, that everybody had heard about his wallpapers, nobody had heard about his socialism. And as a founding figure of the arts and crafts movement, which rejected mass production in favour of traditional handicraft techniques, Morris, I think, has got a lot to say to us. His avowed hatred of modern civilization and his espousal of these traditional techniques have led many to criticize him as little more than a romantic utopian, somebody living in the past. And as he drew many of his early ideas from John Ruskin, this has reinforced that view. But we must emphasize that Morris was a revolutionary. He was a Marxist. He was not a romantic socialist. 
And what is more, he arrived at many of his conclusions about capitalist society before he read Marx, before he became a socialist, and indeed even before Marx's ideas were available in English. And nowhere is this more apparent than in his discussions about art, work, and leisure. His vision of socialism is famously captured in the utopian novel News from Nowhere, published in 1890. This is the Kelmscott Press uh, front page uh, uh, edition of News from Nowhere. And it was inspired by a number of principles. But most notable was the idea that labour should be attractive, work should be attractive, it should be pleasurable. He passionately believed that an individual who is overworked or employed in degrading work cannot be himself. That bringing back joy to daily work would restore men's dignity and their pride in life. His ideas were underpinned by two separate concerns. His hostility to the effects of industrialization and his opposition to the division of labor. He not only protested against the pollution, congestion and squalid waste of factory production, seen here uh, an, an industrial scene from, from England, uh, which would be very familiar to anybody from the north of England who was around 30 or 40 years ago, and again here in the back-to-back -back terraced houses that were, that were built for the workers, but he was also against the rigid organization of the factory, which keeps, he said, the operative virtually chained to a single repetitive task. Images here of the 19th century factory in Morris's time, cotton mill, young kids working on the machines. Apologies for the slight faintness of the slides here. And again, uh, children working in the factory. Morris integrated these ideas into a wider analysis of the relationship between work and leisure, an analysis that began well before he read Marx. Indeed, his early inspirer was the French utopian socialist Charles Fourier. Fourier, who is credited with originating the word feminism in 1837, inspired a whole movement of inter intentional communities or phalanxes in America and elsewhere in the 1840s. And he also used the word civilization in a negative way, much as Morris did. For those of you who haven't come across Fourier before, his ideas have re-emerged re amongst workers like Herbert Marcuse and Walter Benjamin, and more recently amongst anarchist thinkers like Marie Butchin, Paul Goodman, Bob Black in his book The Abolition of Work, and Hakim Bey. In particular, Morris was heavily influenced by Fourier's notion of transforming work into pleasure. Morris conceptualized the relationship between work and leisure in two ways. In the first, he contrasted it with leisure and suggested that attractive labor required the reduction of working hours, or what he called necessary labor time. Secondly, he identified work with leisure and defined attractive labor as the expression and exercise of human creativity. Now, of course, there's an inherent contradiction here because Morris realized that to free up time for this attractive labor, you needed the increase in productivity which the division of labor gave us. In other words, if we want all these goods, if we want the food, if we want the things that we need, then division of labor is the most efficient way of producing those. But that in turn means that you can't then reduce working hours and free up the time for attractive labor. So his attempt to resolve that contradiction resulted in his distinctive contribution to 19th century socialist thought, and it helps to explain his relevance today. He began to write about the relationship between work and leisure in the late 1870s and early 1880s. And he was motivated by two things, his understanding of art and his personal experience. In 1877, he wrote, I do not want art for the few, any more than education for a few, or freedom for a few. And as early as 1879, he argued that art was the expression by man of his pleasure in labor. And furthermore, he suggested that art extends itself into every aspect of life. It's not something in a gallery. It's not something painted by a famous name that you're gonna pay a lot of money for. It's there in every aspect of everyday life. I must ask you, he said, to extend the word art beyond those matters which are consciously works of art, to take in not only painting and sculpture and architecture, but the shapes and colours of all household goods, nay, even the arrangement of the fields for tillage and pasture, the management of towns and of our highways of all kinds, in a word, to extend it to the aspects of the externals of our life. 
For I must ask you to believe that every one of the things that goes to make up the surroundings amongst which we live must be either beautiful or ugly, either elevating or degrading to us, either a torment and a burden to the maker of it, or a pleasure and a solace to him. His own determination to become a craftsman and his despair at the shoddy goods being turned out by mass production led him to design his own. And his ethic can clearly be seen in Red House, which is in Bexley Heath uh, uh, in, uh, in Essex, which he moved into in 1860 after his marriage to Jane Burden. It was a house designed to his specifications by Philip Webb and decorated and furnished by Morris and a group of close friends. Just Edward Burne Jones, probably the most famous pre Raphaelite painter of the 19th century, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, another close friend. Um, and this was a house designed to be pleasurable to live in, created through joy in labour by a group of craftsmen working in harmony. Nicholas Pevner, in his 1936 book, modern, uh, Pioneers of Modern Design, says that Red House is the origin or the beginnings of modernism, a suggestion which might raise some eyebrows, and I'll come back to it later. But he makes clear in his political writings that one of the reasons he became a socialist is because he thought that everybody should be able to live in pleasant surroundings. He was appalled by what he saw in the London of the late 19th century, the living conditions of the working class, and he believed firmly that everybody is entitled to live in pleasant surroundings. In the articles collected together in Hopes and Fears for Art, oops, sorry, that's Red House again. I apologise for that. I usually do this and miss my way with the slides. That's an interior of Red House. Uh, I'm afraid those aren't going to be very clear from where you are, probably. Um, if anybody's ever in England and gets the chance to go, it is a marvellous place. Whereabouts in here? Bexley Heath. Not Where far from... Bexley Heath? Near London. Okay. Not far. <laughs> <laughs> 20, 20, 20, 25 minutes by tube, something like that. Yeah, very close. Um, if you can't get there, go to Kelmstead House in Oxfordshire, which is another Morris house. Um, good question. <coughs> when I say Bexley Heath, that's the trouble. I'm from England. I think I, everybody will know where that is. Yeah. Hopes and Fears for Art, 1882. He identified two sources of motivation for work. Necessity, or the need to make a living, we're all familiar with that, and pleasure, which can arise from a piece of work which is both satisfying to do and of which the product is also satisfying. What makes, what makes worth doing, he asked, in useful work versus useful toil, written in 1885. The hope of pleasure in the work the hope of a product which is both useful and beautiful. And some of you may have come across his well-known phrase, have nothing in your house which you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. I challenge you to go home and do an inventory of your household and see how many of your goods satisfy that maxim. And the other thing he said, which is uh, what make, that makes worth doing, is the hope of rest or leisure sufficient to enjoy it i.e. not a snatched hour at the end of a 14 hour working day, which was common when he was speak, when he was uh, alive, you know, uh, and where the only thing that you had time to do was maybe a, a pint or more in the pub on the way home before you collapse and then go back to work the next day. You need to have enough leisure to enjoy it. Leisure, he suggested, could also be seen in two ways. If work was seen as a necessity, then leisure is simply free time. But if work is seen as pleasure, then it could be thought of as an extension of work voluntary, attractive labour, something that you want to do. I always remember my father, my father was a teacher, but the first thing he did, almost without exception, every day of his life, as soon as he got home from work, he changed, he went out in the garden, and he or the allotments, or whatever, and he started working. And that to him was pleasure, and I'm sure all of us can think of things that we do when the official working day is over, and then we, uh, and we want to relax. He accepted that some jobs were rough, some jobs were tough, that some jobs were tiring, and that such hardship required complete rest. But he argued that if we transform work, then we can then develop our opportunities to perform this attractive labour, which makes life worth living. After he turned to socialism, he continued to insist that work was a necessity and that it met a human desire. Nature, he argued, does not give us our livelihood for free. We must win it by some sort of work. You know, we've got to earn a living, we've got to feed ourselves, we've got to clothe our families, so some work is necessary. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't take pleasure in it. He conceded that periods of rest were necessary to all workers, and he drew upon 
Marx's work to explore the ways in which the amount of free time could be increased. Specifically, Marx convinced him of two propositions, that the key to maximizing the amount of free time that we have was the abolition of capitalist exploitation. He was anticipating the theory of surplus value when he, when he wrote about this. And that this exploitation would be ended by the advances in productivity which sprang from the division of labor. Now, as I've suggested already, he moved towards these positions before he read Marx. He consistently argued that the commercial system was based on exploitation. Workers didn't labor just to provide for their own needs, and still less because they wanted to. They were driven to it by capitalism, who was a capitalist, sorry, in the search for profit, and their desire to escape laboring themselves. Meanwhile, the division of labor separated the worker from the product of that labor, condemned them, he said, to mindless, repetitive work, to do day after day the same tasks without any hope of escape or change. In other words, he's anticipating Marx again and the theory of the alienation of labor. What Marx also gave Morris was a historical analysis of the development of class struggle, of the role of conflict in the process of social change, and an understanding of the historical evolution of industrialism. Morris accepted Marx's analysis that capitalism was heading towards an inevitable fatal crisis. We're still here. As it, moved towards, <laughs> as it moved towards greater efficiency in production, the rate of profit, he thought, would inevitably fall, and capital would be concentrated into fewer and fewer hands. Amazon, Google, that's happening. Whilst more and more skilled workers would be forced into the ranks of the unskilled. Over time, this would lead to a class war, and yet, paradoxically, capitalism's productive forces would produce the abundance that the workers needed. And once we remove the need to make a profit, there'll be a massive labor power available, necessities will be easily provided for, and there will be abundant free time and rest for all. He used Fourier, as I've said, for an insight into how the pleasure of labor could be enhanced. And he used Fourier in particular to underpin his distinction between labor that was forced by nature, i.e. the need to make a living, and labor that was undertaken freely for the love of work and its results. Fourier, of course, was ridiculed by Engels as a utopian socialist, but Morris believed, insisted that his belief that labor could and should be made attractive was an essential one for socialists. It underpinned his belief that the key to unforced labor lay in the transformation of work through art, a belief that, as I stated earlier, predated his conversion to socialism. The kind of art that he had in mind was craft work, or what he called the lesser arts, which he, be he believed had been reduced to an inferior status under capitalism, which had made art the preserve of the wealthy and the professional artist. The ludicrous situ situation we have today, even during a pandemic, when one man can pay millions for a work of art. Pre-capitalism, he argued, workers were specialized craftsmen who worked together to produce a finished article. The outstanding example for him being the Gothic cathedrals. But it could have, the principle could equally be applied to basket makers, carriage makers, any workmen. He saw in the collective endeavors of the medieval guilds a model for future industrial and economic <coughs> organization. He said whether, whether workers were building a grand cathedral or a humble barn, they were the result of collective knowledge, skill, artistry, and the pleasure that they gained from building it. And particularly influential in this, in, in this regard is Ruskin's chapter on the nature of the Gothic, which was reproduced at the Comscott Press in 1892. And it remained the touchstone of Morris's philosophy throughout his life. In it, Ruskin argues for the necessity of pleasure, art, skill, and creativity in work, without which it would never be more than a burden. What is an artist? asked Morris, but a workman who is determined that whatever else happens, his work shall be excellent. Work should be both intelligent and imaginative, with the worker having control over the production. And methods of production should be flexible enough to respond to individual work patterns. Now this, of course, is the absolute antithesis of 19th century industrial production. The division of labor, introduced by Adam Smith and his notorious pin maker, have become synonymous with routine, tedium, and alienation. Work was divided, and so was the worker. Everybody and nobody in the pin mill made the pins. The product belonged not to the worker, but to the capitalist. They were made for no one in particular, but for an anonymous market. 
whose fluctuations pitted one work against one worker against another in the search for work and a fair day's wage. In the hopes of civilization in 1888, Morris said, the individual workman in this system is kept lifelong at the performance of some task quite petty in itself and which he soon masters. And having mastered it, has nothing more to do but to go on increasing his speed of hand under the spur of competition with his fellows until he has become the perfect machine, which it is his ultimate duty to become, since without attaining to that dead end, he must die or become a pauper. You can well imagine how this glorious invention of division of labor, this complete destruction of individuality in the workman, and his apparent hopeless enslavement to his profit grinding master, stimulated the hopes of civilization. <laughs> and what he's saying here, of course, as well is, with this about an increase in the work, we're in, the, we're in the era of uh, time and motion studies. We're in the era of working to the clock. We're in the era of quotas and all of those things that we're all too familiar with now. Yes. Morris saw one of the main obstacles to the realization of his dream as the mechanization of production. It was, he said, responsible for the slavery of mind and body, the instrument through which the division of labor operated. Without the division of labor, sorry, without mechanization, the worker would be a handicraftsman who shall put his own individual intelligence and enthusiasm into the goods he fancies. He fashions. So far from his labor being divided, he must know all about the wear he is making and its relation to similar wares. He must have a natural aptitude for his work. He must be allowed to think of what he's doing and vary his work as the circumstances of it vary. He must forever be striving to make the piece he is at work at better than the last. He must refuse at anybody's bidding, bidding to turn out even an indifferent piece of work. Now it's often been said of Morris, because of statements like this, that he was against new technology, he was against machinery. That is simply not the case. He was not looking for a return to an idealized Middle Ages at all. He was actually very interested in technology. He used machinery in his own business, for example. He used jacquard looms for weaving. He used photography at the Scott Press. He, he used electrotypes also at the uh, Scott Press uh, for duplicating engravings. He contracted out the machine manufacturer of some of his carpets, but always on the proviso that the artistic integrity of the product was not compromised and that working conditions were reasonable. He traveled frequently on the railways. Uh, as I said in, in my previous talk on this, he did something like 500 meetings a year. He was continually up and down the country. So he made use of the railways, benefiting from their speed and convenience, but he complained loudly about the ugliness and filth steam engines inflicted upon the traveller and upon the countryside, as well as the inefficiency of profit-hungry private companies. And again, if you come from England, you'll know all about inefficient uh, railway uh, systems. It is notable that quiet, efficient, and environmentally friendly electric vehicles appear in use from nowhere. Electric barges transport heavy goods up and down the Thames, and he suggests in use from nowhere water and wind power to provide electricity. <coughs> Most importantly for Morris, machines should <coughs> take away the drudgery from work that needed to be done. The essential work without which we can't survive should be done, he thought, by machines. In Socialism, Its Growth and Outcome, written with, a, written with Ernest Belfort Bax, he said, we should say that machinery will be used in a way almost the reverse of the present one. In a socialist community, its use will be relegated almost entirely to such work, because in a society of equality, everything will be thought to pay which dispenses the citizen from drudgery. So the context in which machines were used and developed was of crucial importance to Morris. It is the allowing machines to be our masters and not our servants, he said, that so injures the beauty of life nowadays. Technology would provide humanity with genuine benefits when the contemporary relationship between men and machines was reversed. Morris was frustrated that he could not meet the, his ideal at his own Merton Abbey workshops. It was, he said, impossible to produce art in this profit-grinding society. And, he, you know, you can see... You can see the ambivalence uh, in the choice he's got to make. He's running a business, which has to make money if he's going to pay his workers. But at the same time, he's in competition with other firms who are employing mass production techniques who will soon put him out of business um, if he doesn't make some compromises with the system. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a charge often levelled at Morris. Well, he didn't carry that out with his own business. And he said once, 
If I do that in my own business, it won't have one iota of impact upon capitalist society as a whole. It'll just be one isolated business that will eventually go to the wall. But numerous visitors to the Merton Abbey workshops reported that conditions there were as relaxed as they possibly could be. Here's a contemporary painting of Merton Abbey. His employees were paid above union rates and they worked the eight hour day long before the eight hours act was passed in 1908. Workers could come and go as they pleased. They had access to a collection of books and said one visitor, in the summer season, the roses nodded in upon them at the open windows. Ah. Neighbor turnover was virtually nil. And I think that's a telling point. Very few people wanted to go for a job elsewhere once they worked for Morris. A visitor in 1900, and this is after Morris's death, <coughs> said, imagine by the Wandle sign, an old walled garden. On the banks, long low roof worksheds and a water wheel revolving at its ease. Long strips of printed cotton are rinsing in the streams. Great hanks of yarn fresh from the indigo vat, hung, drying in the air. Dyers and printers moving easily about, all in all a sunlit picture of peaceful work. And one of his workers, reflecting on her time there, said that Morris had introduced to those works a real spirit of comradeship. His experiences at Merton Abbey, allied to his reading of Fourier, led him to expand further his thoughts on work and leisure. Wait it again, I'll just a blue plaque there showing where Merton Abbey works were. They've been demolished now, unfortunately. Uh, and some photographs of the inside of the work. So you can see he's not averse to machinery. It's how it's put to use that he's interested in. The contemporary prints of the, of the works as well. There's his wallpaper, uh, wallpaper production. Okay, so he thought... He thought further now about the conditions for, uh, for work and leisure. And he thought if work and leisure were to become synonymous, four conditions would have to be made, met. One, work would have to meet a vocation. Two, it would have to be performed in pleasant surroundings. Three, it would have to have variety. And four, it would have to be useful. A vocation, pleasant surroundings, variety and useful just take a look at each of those briefly in turn. Work would have to meet a vocation. Each individual, he said, should choose the work he could do best. In Dawn of a New Epoch, written in 1888, he argued that each person's special capacities should be uncovered and developed to their utmost. And even if one person's work is more skilled than another's, that doesn't make it more important or more necessary, nor should it be rewarded any higher. The plowman and the fisherman, he said, are as necessary to society as the scientist or the artist. I will not say more necessary. Neither is the difficulty of producing the more excellent and special work at all proportionate to its speciality or excellence. The higher workman produces his work as easily, perhaps, as the lower does his work. And if he does not do so, you must give him extra leisure, extra means for supplying the waste of power in him, but you can give him nothing more. The only reward you can give the excellent workman is opportunity for developing and exercising his excellent capacity. The manager should be a manager because he or she is good at it, not because of who they are. And that role should not attract more compensation for the wear and tear of life, he said, than any other role. The most important reward for the work should be the pleasure gained in the performance of it, in the development of our special capacities. And that variation, said Morris, would ensure that individuals opted for a range of tasks and no community would be left with jobs undone. Second criteria, performed in pleasant surroundings. Well, I've already referred to his Merton Abbey workshops. Where we need factories, he said, they should be clean, spacious, light and airy, set within green fields rather than congested urban areas. Like Fourier and Karl Marx, he saw them not just as centres of production, but centres of education and entertainment. In a factory as it might be, written in 1884, he said that besides turning out goods useful to the community, it will provide for its own workers work light in duration and not oppressive in kind, education in childhood and youth, serious occupation, amusing relaxation, leisure, beauty of surroundings, and the power of producing beauty. And it's worth spending a little time here just to consider Morris's thoughts on education. He was appalled at the utilitarian education imposed on working class people at that time. 
often referencing grab grind in Charles, in, in Charles Dickens's Hard Times. They learnt the basics, he said, in a totally uncreative manner, plied with useless facts. One size fits all, leaving many functionally illiterate. If you have condemned a man to be a slave, he said, his education must be that of a slave. That was in Commonweal, um, and there's some uh, examples of board schools, uh, since from board schools in the late 19th century. The factory, he felt, could be a centre for education, providing thorough apprenticeships for young people to learn the crafts most fitting to their aptitudes and abilities. They should learn to produce good quality and useful wares, whilst developing mental intelligence too. Such education would carry on into adulthood, where a person would learn for his own pleasure and honour as a good artist, even learning the, the science which underpinned his craft. If you read News From Nowhere, you see that the emphasis was on learning practical and useful skills. Now, Morris, of course, loved books. And in Nowhere, children would see books lying about and picked up out of curiosity. He thought maybe children should start to read about the age of four, and some would later take to it, he said and maybe want a career which involved books. But he said, I don't think we need fear having too many book-learned men, all these university lecturers <laughs> giving talks everywhere, for when children saw adults engaged in pleasing and creative work, they would want to imitate them. If you ever worked in a primary school, where you've got those sort of play corners and whatever, you can see that's exactly what they do. If you've got kids, you'll know how kids follow you around trying to do what you do and imitate what you do. So I think he's got a very, a very good point there. In News From Nowhere, therefore, learning is de-institutionalised. It becomes a means for creating equality, respecting difference, and recognising humanity's oneness with nature. It's a part of life experience, and one he felt <coughs> would make socialists and nurture a desire for change. Morris's views had a huge influence on the development of art education in the 20th century by the likes of Herbert Reed. They were also analogous to Kropotkin and the modern school of anarchist educators like Francisco Ferrer and Emma Goldman. And more recently, they've influenced the likes of Paul Goodman, Colin Ward, and Ivan Illich with his de-schooling society. Anarchist thinker Enrico Malatesta argued that everything depends on what the people are capable of wanting. And that is why Morris emphasized the need for socialist education. It is about learning what to desire and how to realize that desire. And Miguel Abensor has argued that the central theme of News From Nowhere is the education of desire, as it opens up a path for readers to think and act for themselves. I'm sure something that all those of us who've been in the socialist movement for a while have faced is the, ah, oh, it's impossible, it'll never happen. You're, you're, you're reaching for the sky, you know. The, 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 the difficulty of people imagining that they can create a better world is quite stark at times. His third criteria then, that there should be variety in work. All work should combine both mental and physical labor, he felt, indoor and outdoor pursuits. He was skeptical of the value of purely intellectual labor, and he realized that he was fortunate to be able to combine the two. Whereas in contrast, he said, the hodsman, the bricky, carrying his bricks up and down ladders, was too exhausted after a day's work and fit only for beer and sleep. In a socialist society, all men would have the same opportunities. Moreover, he believed that there were few men who would not wish to spend part of their lives in the most necessary and pleasantest of all work, cultivating the earth. In News From Nowhere, Robert the Weaver is also a printer, he studies mathematics, and he writes antiquarian books. And the enjoyment of physical activity is emphasized over and over again. The classic scene with the road builders, where that physical activity is actually a pleasure to them out in the open air and working and creating something useful. And then fourthly, useful work and useless toil. In order to outline his requirements for work to be useful, Morris contrasted it with useless toil. In this category, he distinguished between jobs which were harmful and those which were simply wasteful. In the first category, harmful, he included the production of arms and adulterated food and drink. In the second, he was largely concerned with luxury goods or other consumer items which he considered unnecessary. A whole mass of people, he argued, were occupied with miserable trumpery. Useful work, on the other hand, would meet a genuine need. It would enhance the well-being of the community. Production of such goods would enhance the workers' self-esteem, be durable, and give pleasure to their owners. And once these conditions were met, 
Leisure would no longer be seen as a relief from work. Indeed, people would seek it out. So Guest, in New From Nowhere, for those of you who don't know the story, Guest goes to a Socialist League meeting one night in uh, 1890 or thereabouts, goes home, falls asleep, and wakes up in nowhere uh, some 120 years in the future. And his first encounter in News From Nowhere is with Dick the Ferryman. And he's surprised to find that people don't expect payment for their services. And even more so, that Dick is about to do a good turn to a friend who wants to take his work. It's very difficult for guests to understand that work is freely chosen and enjoyable in nowhere. So, in Morris's socialist society, there would be two kinds of work. Necessary or dirty work. And like Marx, he also assumed here there would be a certain amount of necessary production. This work would be shared out equally. Morris envisages no more than four hours a day, working on the circumstances of his time. We might demur a little bit of that and say two hours would be a lot better, but um, he envisages no more than four hours a day. And machinery, he thought, would develop with the sole purpose of reducing the amount of time spent on that necessary labour. Similarly, and Morris is one of the earliest critics of consumerism, once consumerism had been vanquished, once people had decided what they really needed, that would also reduce the amount of necessary work. As all of those tasks which were, he said, artificially fostered for the sake of making business for interest-bearing capital would be abandoned. Once the mass of the people had attained sufficient leisure to appreciate the pleasure of life, to exercise their special talents, then they would engage in voluntary labour, which for Morris was art and labour synonymous. He believed, he hoped that this would be largely unmechanised, but he did say they could use machines if they wished. Equally importantly for us today, his argument was also that they would produce high quality goods, which would last, thus also reducing production, and like today's built-in obsolescence, where things are built to run out after two years or three years, so we'll go and buy another one. Morris's ideas about the nature of work are at the heart of his vision of an ecological society. Indeed, they're the key difference between a capitalist and an ecological society. He differentiates between good work, good work, sorry, not far removed from a blessing, and bad work, which is a curse and a burden. And the difference between the two lies in the kind of work and who and what it is for. Under capitalism, he said, a tiny class of people exploits a working class that produces all that is produced and supports both itself and the other classes, involving a degradation of both mind and body. It produces useless articles of luxury and folly for the rich, inferior goods for our own consumption, and he used the word ill as opposed to wealth. He said what they're producing is not wealth, not genuine wealth, it's ill. Consumerism, he argued, had bred desires which he forbids us to satisfy, and so is not merely a niggard, but a torturer also. Instead of labouring to live with hope of rest, pleasure, and products both useful and beautiful, men now live to labour. As I've said, these ideas were developed over a period of time from the late 1870s until his death in the 1890s. As early as the Lesser Arts in 1882, he spoke of the need for simplicity of lifestyle, harmony with nature, the wastefulness of the market and about the nature of work. Unless people care about carrying on their business without making the world hideous, he said, how can they care about art? He wrote, it is profit that wraps a whole district in a cloud of sulfurous smoke, which turns beautiful rivers into filthy sewers. And although he was a passionate advocate for art, he did see a role for science too, in the care and maintenance of a small planet. For those who claim Morris is an anarchist, uh, this is a very similar vision to that elaborated by Kropotkin in Fields, Factories and Workshops in 1899. A society of autonomous, self-reliant industrial villages, the integration of physical and mental labour, work satisfaction, the breakdown of the division between town and country, science and art and between the classes. A healthy, unpolluted and pleasant environment with pleasant, pleasant <coughs> workshops, clean air and water, decent housing, gardens and above all, a sense of community. More recently, Murray Butchkin's social ecology draws heavily upon Morris, as do anarchist models of decentralised federation. There are those who have seen the arts and crafts movement as somehow related to asceticism, hair shirts and sandals and vegetarianism, or God forbid, veganism even. Morris was no ascetic. 
apologies, that wasn't a, an assault on veganism. It's just a, a <laughs> Morris was no ascetic. He wanted a good and pleasurable life for all. And he argued that by eliminating surplus value, producing for needs rather than wants, we would regain control of our own lives and at the same time liberate nature. He is therefore a key influence on modern, modern radical environmentalists who reject the complexity of modern life in favour in favor of what Schumacher has called smallness. Just before I finish, to come back to that quote from Nicholas Pegner early on there, when he, he, he regarded the Red House uh, uh, and therefore Morris as the origins of modernism. Well, it's true to say that the founder of the Bauhaus, Walter Gropius, was an admirer of Morris. So that, in itself, suggests that there's something that links the two. The Bauhausers, too, believed in the key principles of unity, craft, simplicity, and community that Morris laid down. And, which might seem a total contradistinction to what I've just um, been talking about, this is what Morris had to say about the housing of the poor in 1884. Now, I'm not going to read it all out, because it's a lengthy quote, but he talks about the houses of the workers built in tall blocks, or what he called vertical streets. Comforts of spare air and privacy. Due share of pure air and sunlight. The gathering of many small houses into a big tall one would give, what, give opportunity for what is necessary to be supplied by the garden space around each block. They would be far more cheerful than the square gardens instead of the aristocratic quarters of town. They would have clusters, playing spaces, communal laundries and kitchens. They would have airy public rooms for social gathering and for dining in. Here we have, in this description of the housing of the poor, Le Cabossier's Radiant City. We have the best municipal housing schemes of the 20th century. How do we square that then with news from nowhere? The answer goes back again to where I started with the nature of utopia. News from nowhere was Morris's reflection of what he found beautiful. Nature, age, handicraft, intimacy. It was his desire. What he wanted us all to do was to imagine a different society, a better society. That is the purpose of utopia. But he also realised that that would not appear overnight. You can't go from A to B, even if you have a revolution. You can't suddenly, the following week, have this beautiful society all laid out. So for Morris, this housing of the poor here was a transitional demand. For others, however, that might be how they envisaged the society after the revolution. In conclusion, then, I would argue that William Morris is one of, if not the most powerful thinkers of the last 200 years, in his conception of how to organise and maintain a decentralised, collectivised, ecological society, in which both social responsibility and personal freedom are given equal emphasis. His critique of capitalism endures because of intense focus on alienated work, which remains as potent a source of mental, physical, and ecological destruction today as it was in Morris's time. Indeed, according to E.P. Thompson, Morris is our greatest diagnostician of alienation. His ideas about the nature and organization of work influenced Anton Pannekirk and the Council of Communists, heavily influenced in the Guild Socialist Movement, pre and post First World War, uh, which achieved some successes, the Building, the building Workers Guild in, in, in Britain, for example, uh, a multitude of anarchist thinkers, and of course, more recently, the Green Movement. We live in an era of rampant inequality, where some multinational corporations control more wealth than poor states. Capitalism, as we are seeing right now, is both unstable and unsustainable, with ever-increasing depletion of resources, global warming, and now a pandemic. We need to think holistically about what constitutes a good society, and work is central to this. The central mechanism for Morris is a shift from quantity to quality in production, which will provide good jobs in a pleasant environment, as opposed to the current system where many workers cannot even fulfil their basic needs. I think I heard on the news last week that 40% of New Zealand children uh, are suffering from food poverty. Shocking in an advanced and wealthy society like this. And where events such as the Rana Plaza, Rana Plaza disaster in Bangladesh, the collapse of a factory with hundreds of deaths, are all too commonplace. I would argue that his vision is not anachronistic. His vision of socialism is a globe-spanning, cooperative society based on freely undertaken, creative, and ecologically sustainable work remains an urgent alternative to the present system of overwork, environmental destruction, and nationalist rivalry, which threatens our health, our sanity, and indeed, in 2021, our 
various uh, our very existence. And for members of the Country Resources Society and all others in the room who are thinking of joining us, he had this to say. One man with an idea in his head is in danger of being condemned a madman. Two men with the same ideas in common may be foolish, but can hardly be mad. Ten men sharing an idea begin to act. A hundred draw attention as fanatics. So we're not far off, we're not far off the fanatic stage, folks. Keep going. <laughs> One thousand, society begins to tremble. A hundred thousand, and there is war abroad, and the cause has victories tangible and real. Why only one hundred thousand? You and I who agree together, it is we who have to answer that question. That's just a list of the things I've referred to during the talk. And if those of anybody is interested further reading on Morris, the best general biography by far is this one, William Morris, A Life for Our Time, by Fiona McCarthy. If you want an introduction to Morris's socialism and Hassan Mahamdali crossing the river of fire, it's a very short and very readable book. If you want the bee's knees, all 700 more pages of it, the E.P. Thompson, William Morris, Romantic to Revolutionary, a wonderful book. And if you just want a, a little bit of reading about Morris himself, this has just come out and it's, it's a really good little selected works of William Morris, uh, entitled William Morris, How I Became a Socialist, which has got a fair range of his pamphlets and his, and, his, and his lectures in there, and a very useful introduction as well, which uh, sort of situates him. Okay, thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions, or if people say, no, get a beer first and then we'll ask them, that's even better, but I'm happy to take them now. <clears throat> I think in the interest, there are some people joining us via live stream, so we may ask them straight into questions as they're there. Scared of empty stage for 10 minutes or so. Um, and then we can all hang out afterwards and stuff again. Um, I'm going to take a, a, a speaking list if you start answering questions as people have them. And, um Oh, one thing that, that interested me when you, when you talked about William Morris and his, and his uh, factory or where he sort of worked and like the workers that worked there was that, like, was it not run under workers, workers self management, management and collectivised? Or was it like, was he still kind of like the owner of the means of production in that environment? Yes, uh, I mean, as I said, uh, and this is a charge I've often labelled label that him out. Uh, he recognised that one firm operating within the, a, a capitalist society yeah, can have next to no impact upon that wider society. Furthermore, if he tried to introduce these principles within one firm, they would very soon be put out of business because they would be undercut by the firms around. And then what use would that be to his workers? Because they would then be out of a job. And if you look at all the, uh, the sort of uh, the, the comments from his workers, you know, they had an eight hour day, they were paid well above average, they had very pleasant working environments. He did have um, uh, um, a share scheme, um, I was going to say a sharing share scheme, but he did have a share scheme for some of the workers, uh, in particular rounds. So, um, no, it wasn't under workers' control. However, they had a lot of freedom uh, in the way in which they operated. You know, they weren't pinned to the bench. So there was a form of self-management? Yes, there was, yeah, there was a form of self-management. You know, they, they, they could, they, could they, they weren't clocking on at nine and clocking off at five type of thing. They, they could go for a walk and then come back and carry on. They could. So yeah, there, there was a lot more freedom in his place than there is in the traditional factory, for sure. But no, this wasn't an oasis of socialism in the midst of a capitalist society. And he realized this. This was part of his anguish that he, on his own, could achieve, could not achieve this ideal society. Uh, and his mantra, of course, was, I need to go out and educate people. And that's what he spent his life doing. I need to go out and educate people. I need to get more people to to, to see this vision, not necessarily his vision. He wants people, the purpose of News From Nowhere is to get everybody to imagine what could it be like? I mean, how many, surely all of us at some stage have gone, there must be a better way. There must be something different. And how many of us have gone, it'll never happen, it's not possible, you know? But he wants people to say, yeah, it is possible. And if we band together, we can make it happen. But your point about his, his factory is right. I mean, I would far rather have worked in his work and have workshops than in just about any other factory in England, I think, at the time, but it doesn't make it a, a little utopia in, in that sense. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it, in, in the sense of, like, because, you know, the, the argument that, like, workers' co-ops and stuff like that under capitalism are not going to achieve, you know, like a socialist society anyway because they, you know, um, they, you know, 
know, they're, they're beholden to the market, you know, like, and so yeah. compromises are made and, and the integrity is I mean, to be fair, we saw in Spain in the early 1930s, uh, in, uh, and, we, uh, in, and we've seen isolated examples elsewhere of, of brief spells when that seems like it might work. And of course, in Spain, they were simply overwhelmed by Franco's fascists and, uh, 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 and put out of existence. Um, but at least they had they had several, uh, you know, a whole region where they were introducing those sorts of principles and trying to make it work. Morris is Morris was regarded by the society from, as, a, as a fanatic, you know, he, it, they thought that his socialism was somehow an aberration. Uh, you know, they, they preferred to look at him as the painter and the and the printer and the designer of nice wallpapers and things. Uh, so he was operating under different circumstances to the, the anarchists of Catalonia or whatever in the Spanish Civil War. But nonetheless, communities have been tried uh, uh, with varying degrees of success. Yeah. Right, okay, so in terms of Morris, when he got married, he, yeah. they, they built Red House in Bexley Heath. He only lived there for four to five years oh. because he realised that uh, it was a long way away from his actual workshops and business and it was taking huge chunks of his time. And Morris, uh, as, as those of you who were here last year know, uh, he was nothing, he's not active. I mean, his famous quotation, anybody who can't sort of run off a tapestry whilst composing a poem, uh, there must somehow be a an old person, you know, and there's that wonderful picture of him, he's got a loom in one corner of his room, and he's got a desk where he's writing poetry in another corner, he's got an easel there with his painting, and he's got his Iliad there that he's translating from the Greek, and he simply moves around the room, so 50 lines of poetry, or as we've got a tapestry now, oh, let's do a bit of translate, oh, I'll get back to that tapestry now. It, he's incredible, but, but the house was miles away from his workshop, so he moved to uh, Kelmscott House in London, which is right on the banks of the Thames, and he also rented Kelmscott Manor out in Oxfordshire for for his rest and relaxation, which was also on the tent because <coughs> he liked rowing and fishing. But that's a manner, and then he's talking about, you know, high-rises from, you know, tower blocks. Okay, well, I mean, like I, I said, I don't get that. Two, two things. But so that's a that was a transitional demand. So let, let's take the yeah. 19th century, well, never mind the 19th century, the present-day industrial oh. city, but the huge population, what is it, London, 8 million, yeah, the yeah. cities with 20 million, yeah. it says we're not going to change that overnight into the sort of society that I want, so that housing of the poor, the tower blocks and things, which, let's face it, animated a lot of socialist architects in the mid 20th century, well, early and mid 20th century, uh, was his transitional demand. Uh, they're living, I mean, I come from the part, so do you, I come from the part of the world, where they're living in back-to-back -back houses with no sanitation and no fresh air and no, you know, so his vision of these vertical towers or whatever you want to, what he called them, uh, was for him, right, that's a better environment. And then he thinks, it, slowly but surely, as we change, workers will want to move, they won't want to live in these huge conglomerations, okay? <coughs> they had to work there because they had to be close to the factory, you know? And that's why they lived in these horrible, horrible conditions of late 19th century uh, society. So that was a transitional demand, 1884. News from Nowhere, which is his fully worked out version, which he wrote later, 1890. That's what I would like it to be in 100 years' time. Or he realised it wasn't going to happen in his lifetime. But as he said, I'm privileged. I'm okay. I've got a nice place to live. I want everybody to have a nice place to live. You know, and even in Christchurch, you know, you've got the River Avon and you've got the, you've got the Hagley Park and you've got Green and you've got all sorts of things. And you've also got some areas where, you know, life is not too good and housing is not too bad. I mean, I've been reading... Sorry, I'm not an expert on this, but I've been reading about some of the social housing where there's gaps between the, the windows and the walls and where the wind whistles through and they're damp and mouldy. And Why should anybody have to live in a place that's damp and mouldy? So, Cool. Uh, I'll continue hearing uh, speaking. I've got four minutes. Hayley, do you mind checking the live stream in case anyone has questions there as well? Thank you. Oh, well, I was being live streamed. Yeah, sorry. I'm interested that uh, Morris is so much into multitasking, he wasn't a woman. Oh, was quite <laughs> oh, that but uh, it, is a, it is a charge often made of us men that we can only do one thing at a time. Yeah. Um, it's not true. I can do two things. I can talk and yes. I can be at the same time. It's possible for us as well, then. That's right. Um, the vision that he had and which he had so well expounded, and which is shared by some anarchists at least, not some who are just bloody gangbits like nut bars, for example, um, is one thing, but it's also something that most of the early communists 
would agree with. Yeah. So the question is, by what process do you get there? What is the role of the state? He doesn't seem to have come to grips with state power, uh, let alone the fact that capital now is as international as it is. Now, of course, um, it would be too prescient to be able to see that into the future. So that kind of vision, uh, how do you deal with it in today's world? Uh, fair comment, Paul. I think um, he does address the question of state power. He does accept, in you from nowhere and in other writings, that there will have to be a revolution and it won't be a peaceful one because they, he'd, he'd experienced Bloody Sunday and the clubbing down of the crowds in Trafalgar Square and all that. He said the state will resist. It doesn't matter how many of us there are, and we've seen this in numerous, you know, Chile, we've seen it in, uh, we've seen it in uh, Burma now, we're seeing it, in, you know, the state always resists and big business always resists. And, the two, and he recognised that and he said, it would be good if it could come peacefully, I can't see it. It's going to have to be a revolution. And then, in the period after that, we'll have to have some form of central organisation, because let's face it, revolutions are disruptive, we've got to feed the people, we've got to... But, uh, without going too much into detail about how he expounds that in news from nowhere and elsewhere, he does see, he, he is no Leninist, he sees a gradual transition uh, after the revolution from, and, and, and as quickly as possible, from some sort of organised uh, state system into a much more decentralised local federation of communities, that's his idea. Internationally, though, because they're well, that's, I mean, as you say, he couldn't have thought, well, he could possibly, he couldn't have foreseen that the, 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 the really international nature of capitalism is, is now. I mean, it was starting to happen then, but at the, at the time it was mainly national combines rather than international combines. No, he couldn't have seen that, and that, and that of course, is one of the most uh, um, interesting and pressing discussions, I think, of the current socialist movement. You know, well, are we still talking, you know, we've had this conversation a couple of times, haven't we? Are we still talking international, or is it possible that we can do it step by step by step, you know, country by country? I don't know, but you're right, Morris doesn't address that international nature of capitalism as such, but uh, as I said, he's writing 120 years ago, to be fair, oh, yeah, 30 years yeah. ago. Yeah. Uh, but he certainly addressed the question of the state, and that's one of the reasons why he, he split with the Social Democratic Federation and set up his own organisation, because he wasn't interested in state socialism, what he called basically sops to the workers to buy them off. Yeah. Yeah, that was the Labour Party. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that probably leads me on to my question. I found it really eliminating in some way. But, I mean, Morris did actually have detractors. One of them, of course, was Bellamy, who, of course, as you know, wrote from basically very much in favour of the great state for living in and you talk sorry, can't about you questions know. can't hear the answers, I'm sorry. Okay, I apologise for the answer. So the question yeah. was, that, well, we haven't finished yet, but he's, yeah. he's talk, Morris had his detractors, uh, one of whom was Edward Bellamy, who wrote a book called Looking Backward. Yeah, and essentially, of course, but you also mentioned, of course, the power that Morris had to actually influence the Guild Socialists, who, of course, played, played quite a major part in the late, early Labour Party as well. It might be worthwhile considering and so on. I mean, what sort of impact do you think the Guild Socialists had? Were they successful for Morris? How do you, successful do you think they were in combating, say, Bellamy? So the question is, uh, I said that uh, Morris influenced the Guild Socialists, and the question is how successful do I think the Guild Socialists were uh, in, in combating this sort of vision of st the state as the, as the arbiter of, of society? Um, I suppose the short answer must be, if we're talking practically, is that they weren't very successful. Uh, in the UK, and I can't speak, I know nothing about uh, New Zealand in terms of guilt socialism. I know it did have some influence in the early labour and socialist movement here, a little bit. Uh, but there, there was a building guild set up in, in the UK, which was quite successful for a while in, in getting uh, contracts. Um, but again, it was an isolated instance in a sea of conservative trade unions, if you like. Um, but the ideas of guild socialism have certainly continued to this day and have become a comeback into fashion in, 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 in some ways in, in, in a lot of, uh, in a lot of uh, thinkers. So, and I think this is one of the functions, whether it's Morris, whether it's us, whether it's, is to keep those traditions, those ideas alive um, and, and, and to continue to discuss them in the hope that you know, sooner or later we may get the chance to uh, 
to explain it. Guild socialism was a very short-lived movement, really, in terms of its actual existence. 20 years? Yeah. Um, it was set up as an alternative to Labour parties and to trade unions. Um, it had a limited success in England. I can't speak about anywhere else. Uh, and then it probably almost disappeared by the early 1930s and the onset of the Great Depression. Uh, Morris's News from Nowhere was actually written as a counterblast to Bellamy. For those of you who have not read Edward Bellamy looking backward, his is a vision of a very centralised state where technology rules. Um, there, is no, there, is no, there is no coming together of mental and physical labour. And the idea is that everybody works hard, uh, technology rules the rules, you all retire at 45, and when you retire at 45 you'll get a television to spend the rest of your days happily gazing at the screen because you've earned it. Uh, that's a very brief and critical summation of Bellamy, but uh, it was very popular in New Zealand then. It was, it was hugely popular in New Zealand. It sold, it sold over a million copies in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, New from nowhere didn't sell anywhere near as many. Question. Yeah, um, just the whole critique of consumerism and you know useless trinkets and stuff. Did yeah. he have like a robust distinction between you know trinkets and his own like floral wallpaper and stuff? Or hey, well, was it more generally was he worried that in the socialist you know utopia you'd have just the same surplus of Mediocre art. Like, how did he make that? How do you deal with that issue? Well, to, to take your first, to take your first point, um, have nothing in your house which you do not believe to be either useful or beautiful. So I think he would have argued that his wallpaper was there for people to choose if they felt that it would make their house beautiful. Morris, funnily enough, well, Morris did use some of his wallpapers, but if you go to Count Scott Manor, he much preferred whitewashed walls. Uh, or most of his walls were plain white. But his argue, have nothing in your house that you don't believe to be beautiful. Uh, and judging by the popularity of his wallpapers over the last, which, you know, which is the way in which most people remember him, there's a lot of people who think that those wallpapers do that. In terms of social society and trinkets, um, well, I, I just come back to what I said, useful or beautiful. So, I mean, I've tried this myself. But just have a look around. Are there any things on here that I've bought and sometimes spent quite a lot of money? That really, when I think about it, I don't know. Are there things I've bought that I hardly ever use? Yeah. Why did I buy them? Don't know. Do I really need an electric toothbrush? Not really. That's it. He envisaged in socialist society, in his, his socialist society, that people would identify their needs and they would be a lot less than what we call needs now. You want food, you want clothing, you want a decent house. And Morris liked to smoke back in the day before the link between smoking and cancer. So one of the scenes in News From Nowhere, he goes into a uh, into a place where the bloke, his bloke's attractive labour is making pipes, fancy car pipes and all sorts of different ones. And Morris likes to smoke when he's relaxing in leisure, and the guy gives him a nice pipe that he's, that he's spent, you know, and Morris goes off happy as Larry, and that, that's what he's got. Uh, Morris liked books, so for him, and for him books are useful because they give you knowledge. But, so yeah, I think he, he firmly believed, and so do I, that if we change the basis of society, if we reduce the amount of working hours, if we give people pleasant surroundings in which to live, actually, we'll soon find that we don't want a lot of the things that we currently go out and buy, because we'll have other things to do. You know, uh, When you've spent eight or nine or 10 hours toiling at a job that you hate, then maybe going home to all these trinkets, as you call them, is, is perhaps the way in which we uh, remove that drudgery from our mind. But I, I think uh, I, I, I can understand what he's saying there. Just, just, just from my. There's a program on TV, Hall of His. I think that's that probably the that's probably the, the prime example. People just buy, get things, don't they? Just hoard them. You know. I do like his wallpaper. To be fair. <laughs> <laughs> not criticizing. Yeah, I don't like all of it, but I like I like some of it. I, in my house, in my house back home, I've got Willowbound Miner on the walls, and I've got pomegranate going up the stairs. Yeah. Um, and I love it because I think it enhances the beauty, if you can call it that, of my house or the surroundings in which I live. Other walls I've got plain white, just like here. Um, yeah. Well, the, yeah, the beauty is like the protection from like the profit motive, and so people just have like all these nice looking stuff. Like they like, 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 like. Yeah. <laughs> I've got Al on the list, but I might jump to Dennis's. Al's piece of work already, if that's all right. Al. Dennis. Yeah, from uh, what you know, William Morris, how would he have viewed? worker-owned and controlled industries and factories? With the greatest of pleasure, yeah. I think. 
I mean, his idea was not huge factories, as we've seen. His idea was more cooperative workshops, yeah. small scale. Yes. Uh, you know, but he, but they would have been cooperative enterprises, yes. just like he thought the medieval guild was. Yes. You know, it, I mean, if, if you read the descriptions of the building of the great cathedrals of the Middle Ages, or even of uh, of the barns or whatever, it's a group of craftsmen. It's a stone carver and it's a it's a woodworker and it's a, yeah. you know all all working together yeah. on the finished product. Yes. Uh, so he he would have yes he, he would have seen that as I think something to be aimed for. Yeah, yeah. 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 for sure. But he wanted to move away from the large factories. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I, I think I got that. So I think the question is, if we're talking about a federation of communities, why are we today fixated on national economies? Is that what you're saying? Uh, why are we stuck between national aid, aid, aid and national economy? Why is it that we So Morris was writing before the before the uh, the advent of what I would call uh, monopoly capitalism, like international mono monopoly capitalism. So he couldn't have foreseen that, and it is one of the great problems for socialists today who are arguing for a different society. How do we overcome the global nature of economies and the international links between all the uh, uh, all the major economies and, 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 the, and the major firms? It's a massive question. His vision. And, and he, he accepted that there would have to be some international trade. I think he accepted that. So New Zealand will lack certain things, whether it's um, uh, raw materials or minerals or whatever. So there will have to be some trade. Um, so his federation of small communities, we're talking about within, in his case, England, within New Zealand, and then every other country the same. How that operates at the international level is not something he wrote a great deal about. But he did, he did briefly say that he thought there would have to be some mechanism of distribution and exchange between countries, you know? So that because there are certain things that countries don't have in terms of raw materials and the like. But again, if we adopt this sin for life, if we adopt this um, production for need rather than want, then those items that we do need to get from elsewhere will be far fewer, far fewer. Uh, I'm wondering if that answers your question, because it's a difficult question to answer, but um, um, that was how he saw it. Federation of small communities in, their own, in your own country, some form of, the only thing that a state, if we're going to have a state, would, would be responsible for was distribution and exchange. So that everybody, so that, you know, if, if Auckland hasn't got enough, you know, I don't know, what, what could we say, what do we produce down here at Auckland? I don't know, Vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if one part of New Zealand doesn't have enough avocados, then somebody's got to get, and, uh, and we, if we agree that avocado is a need, I've been slightly flippant now, then those avocados have to be got from A to B. And in return, if the place we're getting the avocados from hasn't got something and we've got them, then we, there'll be some mechanism for organising that distribution and exchange, which is understandable. I mean, you could have it at a local level. I mean, I'm sure Christchurch. Could, could have its own localised distribution exchange with Ashburton and uh, Dunedin and what have you, but for longer distances you'll need some form of uh, mechanism. Uh, that, that's as far as I can go with that, so I apologise if that doesn't answer your need. News from nowhere is not a blueprint. We cannot foresee, Morrison, we cannot foresee what this society of the future is going to be like, 
But if we don't have a vision of what it's like, what is the point of agitating for change, for a revolution, and what have you? He thought a revolution without some vision of what we're trying to achieve would just be a, a bloody mess, to be honest. You know, and it'll just collapse, as we've seen several times. So we've got to know what we want. And then, it, another famous phrase, and it might turn out to be something different to what we originally imagined it might be. But vision, imagine the change, and then maybe we can get there. Um, in the interest of, oh, yeah, go on. <laughs> yes? Just because I heard you say at one point, and I, I don't quite remember the quote, but you said, like, why is he not an anarchist? Why he's not an anarchist? Uh -huh. And so what do you think are the key points why he's not an anarchist and he, he definitely is a socialist? Right, okay, that's a really good question. So, we have to remember again that in the mid to late 19th century, words did not mean the same as they mean now. So the word, com if we say communist now, to so most people in New Zealand, they'll go, ah, Russia, bloody revolution, Stalin, mass murder, uh. Communism did not mean that in the late 19th century. It meant a communal society. Similarly, anarchism at that time was associated with explosions, bombings, bank robberies, and the like. Um, what do they call it? The, something of the deed. Um, propaganda. propaganda of the deed, that's right, yeah. Uh, and so Morris wanted to clearly distinguish himself from that. Now Kropotkin, in his Fields, Factories and Works, I think, Morris was really, really analogous to Kropotkin, and also if you come across Edward Carpenter, who was also around the same time, very, very similar. I think if Morris was alive today, he might well call himself an anarchist. He certainly called himself a, liberta called himself a libertarian yeah. socialist, and I think he might well call him an anarchist, but at the time, to call yourself an anarchist, you were, you were very unlikely to attract the sort of following he was trying to achieve, because it was associated with, as I say, the propaganda of the deed. Uh, and his ideas are very, very analogous to anarchism in so many ways. Yeah. Well, social democracy was Marxism. Pardon? Social democracy was Social, yeah, Marxism, there's no such thing. Marxism was social democracy. Now, of course, social democracy means the Labour Party. Yeah, but then it meant Marxism. So that's the problem with terminology, yeah. and that's why. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, Online question. All right. Online question. It's a bit of a long one. No. Sentence. <laughs> yeah, to answer the to, to go, and I, I, I'm not going to make a psychoanalysis because um, I just know nothing about it. But um, <laughs> to answer the last part, I think I, I'm hoping that what I talked about when I talked about Morris' work in leisure would answer that question because 
if we have the sort of society that Morris envisages, where we produce for need rather than want, and we reduce the amount of goods, i.e. consumers, then eventually we'll arrive at the state where people do not desire these things. I mean, Morris said, and I quoted this, co consumerism or capitalism breeds desires that we cannot obtain, therefore it is both niggardly and a torturer. So by moving away from a consumerist capitalist society, that should reduce these desires, this desire for things we can't have. You know, what is advertising all about? You know, what is the advertising on the TV? It's all about creating desire, telling us we want something, even though actually deep down we probably don't. But you have know? you not also been saying that the desire no longer is part of the consumption, you know, kind of position as the production? So, like, yeah, the only desire like becomes to be able to create and yeah. enable, you know, create something that is... Yeah, it, it, exactly. It'll, it'll be replaced so by the desire to create. Yeah, it comes yeah. into the, yeah. you know, the yeah. production process. Yeah, the desire to the, the doing, of yeah, yeah, rather than the consuming. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't disagree. Whoever it is that sent, I won't call it a question. Whoever sent that, and I don't disagree with some of his earlier statement about capitalism breeding desires, yeah. desires that we can't achieve, uh, and and that, and that is, and I think Morris would agree with that too. Um, I mean, I think the answer to his question at the end is just that, that in the society that Morris envisages in use from nowhere, we won't have those desires for things, you know, we'll have a desire for creative labour where we can make what we want, what we need, so the man who gets great pleasure out of producing the pipes that then Morris gets to go up and enjoy his stuff, <laughs> that's fine, I mean, there's an example of desire fulfilled, the desire of the worker to have pleasurable labour, the desire of the person to take you know, to, to have what he needs from each according to his needs to each according to his wants, to quote a famous uh, socialist. Uh, I'm afraid I can't answer any of that psych psychoanalytical um, stuff. I need to retrain. <laughs> cool. All right, in the interest of time and being able to mingle for a bit and maybe get another drink, if people would like to, I'd like to close off the questions there if that's okay with everybody. Thank you so much for coming along. If you would like to get the emails and aren't currently getting them, please write your name down on the list over there. Come to talk to any of the people that are talking about in these speaking sessions. Most of us are members, so we'll be able to tell you about how awesome it is to be in this place. Otherwise, thank you so much, Martin. It was excellent. <laughs>